Hello. Welcome to the next presentation, where we've heard all about mass surveillance by big companies and the NSA, but there's something much more tangible happening now as well, which is body cams by the police. Um, the next talk will be by uh, Rayo Sanger, who is a private, uh, privacy advocate for Bits of Freedom, which is the Dutch equivalent of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, this talk, however, will be from Freedom Inc. And it's about the pros and cons of body cams. I must warn you, there will be shocking videos in this presentation. Uh, I just watched it, it's like, whoa, holy shit. Um, <laughs> so please welcome, give a warm welcome for Rayo Sanger. Thank you, and thanks for having me here. Um, I propose we have bad weather next time, because then there will be a lot more people here, I think. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about the use of body cams by the police, and how, in a way, the body cams are blinding the police, I think. Uh, I'm Rayo Sanger, and I work for Bits of Freedom, the leading Dutch digital civil rights organization. And although I do like working at Bits of Freedom, um, it has a fairly narrow focus. So there is so much more that care to care about, but it falls outside of the scope of Bits of Freedom. And that's why I do, uh, in my spare time, work for Freedom Inc. And um, you may have heard from Freedom Inc. before, because um, I was able to show that the Dutch police is using military drones um, almost every third evening in the Netherlands somewhere uh, at some point in time. Um, right now I'm mostly focused on the use of uh, body cams by the Dutch police. And one of the first times I realized the power of a video recording of the police behavior was with the Rodney King beatings in 1991. Um, that's not a body cam by the way, it was shot by a bystander from a balcony. And soon after the footage was uh, published, um, it sparked uh, a really uh, a big debate. It raised public concern over the way the police was treating minorities. This footage has been very significant, uh, even long after. The footage made it into popular culture, like for example the movie Three Kings that was released eight years later, with Ice Cube in it, and where it played an uh, important, uh, pro prominent role. Here's a clip of it. By orders of the ceasefire, signed in Saffron, March 3rd, the United States military hereby confiscates all materials stolen by Iraq from the state of Kuwait. That means everything you took is going back. Everybody stay calm and we'll get through this as quickly as possible. Is that clear? Good. So the acquittal of the four police officers that were, doing, that were taking part in this beating uh, led to what is known the LA burning riots and which set the uh, so, uh, city alight. These riots resulted in 53 deaths and over 2,000 people were injured and another 12,000 were uh, arrested. This is what some powerful footage can trigger. And of course, the footage is only a means of raising attention of some bigger and less visible societal issues. But by now, uh, attaching body cams to the o uniforms of uh, the police officers is very popular and there's um, uh, a lot of footage available on YouTube. Here's an example of the arrest of the Florida uh, Department of Law Enforcement. So if real action is shown, this is what you see. Lots of shaking movements, lots of yelling, and possibly lots of aggression. I'll get back to this video uh, at the end of my talk. So for most activists, their position on the body cam use uh, by the police is fairly binary. Or they are in favor because of the accountability, and then they, p they prefer to have the camera always on, so no incident will be missed. Or they are on the other end of the spectrum, um, and they see body cams as just not a means of a powerful surveillance. But me, I'm somewhere in the middle. I think there's merit to both positions and it all depends on the goals and policies that are applied. I'll explain this uh, in this talk. Here's the outline. First I will shortly describe the use of body cams by the Dutch police uh, until today. And then I will focus on the risks um, of the use of body cams for the police, for the individual police officers, but also for the police organization. 
Then I will ha um, have a lengthy um, discussion about the issues arising from the use of body cams, so the consequences that has for the um, policies that governing their use. And I will end with a short quiz where you can judge uh, the footage yourself. So the Dutch police has a long history of experimenting with the use of body cams. It is what I would call a perpetual experiment with no real beginning and definitely no ending. Here's the announcement of the Dutch government of 2008 in which they announced the, large, the start of a large project around technological tools for the police. The 1 million euros were meant to decrease the violence against the police. And one of those technologi technological tools for the police um, would, would, uh, was the body cam. Its goal, preventing violence um, towards the police, is noteworthy as body cams uh, in other countries are often used as a uh, means to curb down the violence uh, of, the, of the police, so from the police. And um, because the cameras are in this pilot were expected to work the other way around, uh, the research results from abroad cannot be translated to the situation in the Netherlands one-to-one. -one. So that was nine years ago. The truth is, the police started experimenting nearly 20 years ago, in 1997, two years before Three Kings uh, was released. This year is a short article from a newspaper from the time, and it says, amongst other things, in 1997, we ran experiments with mini cameras strapped onto the helmets of the mounted police. Unfortunately, there are no photos next to this article. We can only guess how this must have looked. However, images do exist of race drivers and uh, football players outfitted with cameras. Here's Steve McQueen. <laughs> Here's Steve McQueen, a race car driver uh, with a camera attached to his helmet. Probably the cameras of the police were a little bit smaller because this image, I think, this photo was taken, I think, like a decade before. Um, but these race car drivers didn't use the cameras during the races because they were too clunky. What they did is they were using them in the training and then used the footage that was shot during the training in the actual race. Football players in the US were also outfitted with cameras during their games. And that was um, uh, reverted fairly quickly because, interestingly, it turns out that the football players were very, very competitive and during the game there was lots of swearing and obnoxious language. And of course, broadcasters didn't like to hurt the sensitive souls of the people at home watching the game. The news article goes on to say that the trials were promising, but unfortunately the article doesn't explain the goal of the pilot, so it's rather hard to tell, um, uh, uh, it's rather hard to interpret it, this uh, comment. And also worth noting, the article says that the images were sent to the commanding officer. That suggests more or less real-time transmission of the footage. It implies that one of the goals of was to improve strategic decisions of the police operations. It is, for these days back then, uh, surprisingly advanced technology, I'd say. And this announcement doesn't come as a surprise. One of the first announcements the police did this year was we're going to start a pilot with body cams. This announcement is, I expect, the biggest, uh, so the, the start of the biggest rollout of body cams among the Dutch police. And how ironic, the body cams should improve your view of the world, but on a meta level, the police has failed to do exactly that. For some part, I think the industry is to blame, and of course, in combination with a lack of critical questions from the police. In the next video, you will see Rick Smith. He is the founder of Exxon. And Exxon, uh, maybe that name doesn't ring any bells, but they're the same company that also produced the Taser. Um, early this year, he also had an announcement to make. And here's a short clip from that. Help with these challenges, today, we are proud to announce a nationwide program offering a free body camera to every police officer complete with all the software, storage, and training that they would need. Prepare for the future of law enforcement. We've developed far more than just body cameras. We've built and connect these cameras securely to massive storage servers in the cloud with all the necessary software to process, analyze, and share this data across thousands of people. Okay, that's too bad. Let's try this one more time, and otherwise I'll just explain what, it, what he says. Oh. Help with these challenges, today we are proud to announce 
a nationwide program offering a free body camera to every police officer, complete with all the software, storage, and training that they would need. Okay, just let me then explain what he says. So maybe you've <laughs> understood already. Um, Exxon um, announced that they were planning to provide every police officer in the US with a free body cam. And they were saying, okay, we, we will provide all the, uh, uh, the, the, the infrastructure around it you need to use those cameras. And he is also talking about intelligent network, massive storage, and sharing across thousands of agencies. That scares me a bit. Always I had to, th also I had to think of uh, Opera. <laughs> Everyone gets free stuff. Um, the rest of Exxon's announcement dramat dramatizes the hard work of police officers, the lack of support of policymakers, and the lack of good tools. It's hard to resist such an offer, I think. And it makes the industry dictate how the police thinks about storage and the use of this, of this footage. And I can foretell um, the police departments that fall for this seemingly generous offer will have a hard time to scale back when they decide to stop using these body cams. In the Netherlands, the situation is not much different, although industry may not be as pushy as in the US. And that, of course, is because the Netherlands is only a very small market compared to the US. Nevertheless, the Dutch police is adopting body cams on an increasingly large scale without knowing exactly why. The Dutch police commissioned a literature study last year doing a meta-evaluation of all internationally available research on the use of body cams. The researcher who did the study was able to compile an overview of 22 evaluations from all over the world. Only nine of them qualified for scientific minimum standards and still many of the questions remain unanswered. So, one of the Canadian police forces uh, named some of the common issues with uh, research on body cam use by the police. And these are some of the complicating factors in many of the evaluations. Technology is rapidly evolving. Usually there's a small number of participants with even less participation in the feedback process. Participation is often on a voluntary basis. There's a lack of relevant and reliable baseline statistics. And research is often done by professional evaluators with little knowledge of policing, or the other way around, police officers with limited research experience and many other duties to perform. In other words, there is still very little solid evidence to support or refute most of the claims made about body cams. Another also interesting uh, conclusion Although most articles include pros and cons, the majority of the main headlines promote the idea of inevitability. Again, in the Netherlands, the situation is no different. The meta-evaluation also considers the evaluations of the Dutch police. And to date, there have been only four evaluations, and the most recent one dates back to 2011. None of these evaluations were done in a way that is scientifically solid. So the researcher of the meta-evaluation concludes, none of the research allows for conclusions about the casualty about the effect, uh, effects of the body cams. And the Dutch police themselves also arrived at a similar conclusion. At present, there's no clear image of whether body cams are effective or not and whether there are any undesirable side effects and how to mitigate those. That's the conclusion after 20 years of experimenting with body cams. That solid proof of body cam uh, use is uh, how, how these work is important um, is because it will have a huge impact on the policies you will, um, uh, governing the use you will draft. So for example, there is, um, there is some research that is um, showing that the use of violence by the police is decreasing when the body cams are used. However, none of the research tells us why that is. Is it because bystanders are behaving better when the police officer wears a body cam? Or is it because the police officer tends to be more reluctant to step into a hazy, con hazy conditions? Which can happen if the police officer uh, is afraid that the footage can be used against him. Of course, the latter um, is probably something as we as a society uh, find uh, undesirable. Additionally, Solid research allows for solid policies and technical specifications, so we need to have that research, I think. So while there is still no hard evidence for much of the claims around body cams, the police is really blinded by those body cams. 
they want to use them, uh, what, uh, w whatever happens. And that comes with a risk for citizens because it may lead to unbalanced policies. For example, the police may be allowed to make any recording of you at any time, while the other way around, you are not allowed to access that footage that was made of you. But I think the use of body cams can also be damaging to the police themselves, both on an individual level as well as on an organizational level. Here's a dash cam video of the death of Philando Castile, um, which, was m which made the, the video made headlines, not this one, but um, a related video made headlines, because his girlfriend sitting next to him was streaming much of what, has ha what happened to Facebook Live. You have a okay. firearm okay. on me. Don't reach for it then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. So Castillo was stopped because, if I recall correctly, a broken tail light, that's all. The footage is hard to analyze, and that's a problem with body cam footage uh, often, um, due to, amongst other things, the angle, the quality, and the fact that the view through the windshield is uh, obstructed. Apparently, uh, Castillo was showing no aggression. He immediately tells the, uh, fire the officer that he has a firearm on him. You hear him saying that at the beginning of the um, video. The officer... Uh, tells him repeatedly not to pull the gun, but nevertheless, Castillo reads into his pocket. Um, it is being said afterwards that he, tri that he wanted to pick his uh, driver license. But the police officer then has to decide in a split second. And the thing is, um, after the, all this happens, um, the, his supervisor or the prosecutor uh, rev um, will review this f footage as well. But the supervisor or the prosecutor may rewind this video 30 times and may reach to a different conclusion than the police officer did in a split second. So I think that the, in that case, the police officer may have a hard time explaining uh, his decision of that moment, um, even uh, when he did no wrong. So the point is, I'm not sure whether a police officer should be happy with recordings like this because it puts him in a, uh, in a problematic position. And I value uh, privacy, including the police officers. So now consider a, poli uh, a policy where the police officer is required to have the camera running all the time. I'm pretty sure police officers are humans and, like, and act like such. So a police officer sh um, is gossiping in at the bagel joint about their, uh, about their uh, supervisors or at the latest policy change in the department. Or consider a officer uh, that is returning from an accident where a small kid was killed by a drunken driver. Um, I would expect the police officer to need to let off some steam and may, he may do that in a questionable language. All of that should be no problem at all. But it may become a problem when all is recorded and may be used against the officer. And the feeling that being watched and chilling effects of it for a police officer, that's not my invention. Take the Boston police department, for example. After some racial incidents, the department's staff decided that the police officers should be outfitted with body cams. Initially, they were made available to the police officers on a voluntary basis. However, as it turns out, there were no takers. Um, the officers said it's not in our contract and the officers felt like being monitored all the time. So then the supervisors started to point volunteers um, and, as a, and the police union didn't like that and they went to court. Um, by the way, they lost that case. Um, the same is in Netherlands, true. Here's a partial page of a, uh, I had the police uh, make public after a Freedom of Information Act request. It's the LVL evaluation of a pilot of the use of body cams by the police in Amsterdam. And it says that uh, some police officers felt watched when required to use a body cam. And that did not even go fully away when the participants, when the participation was uh, done voluntary on a voluntary basis, or when the police officers themselves could decide when the camera was uh, was activated. So these are all kinds of reasons why I think that the police officers should be reluctant to use a body cam as well. But also there's the uh, obligatory oops, potentially damaging the trust in police in general. The Netherlands has a long history of lost recordings of important events. 
We're still looking for the missing photo film documenting the role of the Dutch army in Srebrenica's downfall. We're still wondering why an important call of the deputy, deputy minister wasn't recorded while being wiretapped. And in recent years, at least three ministers and deputy ministers had to step down over lost recording of a deal with a criminal. Body cams are now different, I tell you. Just consider, the camera was turned off, uh, the battery was empty, there was a disc failure, uh, the hand was in front of the camera, um, uh, the recording was accidentally removed, the recording was not accidentally removed. Um, someone thought it was a good idea to um, to make a compilation of all the important pieces of uh, footage and by doing so invalidating uh, the forensic value of uh, the, the footage. So if the Dutch police will, is using body cams on large scale, I can promise there will be a PR disaster with the unde undesirable result of decreasing trust in the Dutch police. So when drafting policies for body cam, for body cam used by the police, there are many issues to consider, and I'll walk you through some of them, or just only, only some of them. The obvious question, of course, and the most easy way to explain all the difficulties surrounding the use of body cams by the police is when should it be on and when should it be off? Um, when it's not always on, you will potentially miss uh, the recording of some uh, behavior of the police officer. But it's when it's always on, there are many priv privacy-related issues uh, that come into play. And then there are also secondary issues. If you have an always-on policy, then a lot is recorded, and there's a lot to store, and there's a lot to process, and which may impact the operation of the police just as well. Here's the current Dutch policy on the use of body cams. It's just one single piece of paper. Keep in mind also that Although the police has started to introduce the body cams on a larger scale than ever before, uh, there is no finalized policy. Just, this is just a temporary policy. I find it kind of worrying that the police is starting to use tools without having given enough thought to the policies that surrounding the use of these tools. So the temporary policy says that the police officer is expected to exercise discretion and activate when deemed appropriate. In other words, when a situation escalates, turn, activate the camera, turn it on. But that's not good enough for me. One of the reasons for using body cams in the Netherlands is to prevent what has been dubbed racial profiling, where some people are stopped overly frequent. Now, imagine you are stopped for the third time this week just because of your skin color and the car you're driving in. You behave nicely, but after a couple of minutes of half-baked questions by the police officer, you start to respond annoyed and agitated. If the situation escalates, only then the camera will be turned on. And the uh, result is that is that all the context is missing and you will have a hard time to defend yourself. So what is the best policy? Maybe the best policy is just always off, but unfortunately I fear inevitability as well. Uh, the police will use body cams, uh, that's more or less a fact and we have to deal with that. So if the police officer decides, the risks are clear. Always on, I'm not, very, or I'm not particularly worried about the um, uh, added surveillance capacity of the, of the police, but there's a bigger worry. A camera that is running all the time may also make some people reluctant to talk to the police when they know their conversation is being recorded. Think about someone who is a witness of a murder or maybe a victim of rape. I can imagine those people want to talk to the police, but not when a camera is just right in front of the nose. So here is where I'm standing right now. The camera must record any interaction with a citizen when the interaction is taking place on the initiative of the police. That includes situations where the police responds to a call for help and is dispatched from the control room to an incident. In other cases, the police may not record uh, the interaction unless explicitly um, requested by the citizen. And to make it a little bit more complex, in any case, this guideline may be waived when strictly necessary. For example, when a conversation is initiated by the citizen, but out of the blue the citizen draws a knife, you want to have that recorded, of course. So here's another issue. Um, who has access, when and which safeguards do, uh, apply? So there are many situations where access to the, re uh, to the recordings may be useful, like for example as evidence in a court case. 
it's important that all parties have access to the raw footage. And even when it is not used in an, uh, as evidence, if the recordings are available, the recordings should still be available to the, um, for access to the defendant, because it may show that the defendant was nowhere near the knife that was used in a stabbing. And even if there's no case at all, you have the right to access your personal data that is held by the police and the police has on you. So, and then there are many other ways on how the um, uh, body cam footage can, uh, can access, for example, in the US with the Freedom of Information Act, or maybe as in the Netherlands, the police uses it as a kind of propaganda. They want to give insight on the, the daily job of the police officer. In any case, when talking about access, to this footage, you're also talking about limitations such as privacy protection. Here's an example. So the police is clearly struggling with the protection of privacy of some of the people involved here. You see a suspect whose head, not just his face by the way, has been blurred. At the same time, he's wearing some fairly recognizable pants and they're now long, no longer vi visible, but, but they were. Um, and you also may recognize his bike. In other parts of this video, the voice of the suspect is clearly audible. The face of some police officers um, are blurred while others are not. So clearly some decisions have been made, but the question is, of course, is that enough? Privacy is the Achilles heel of the pilot. That's a quote from a document from the same police department, uh, and it's evaluating the publication of videos like the one you've just seen. The same document says, the requirements put forward by the public prosecutor, the facade of a house may not be recognizable. That was 2014. Now let's have a look at a fragment of a video that the same police department published last year, so two years later. And I'll start with the uh, control room dispatching a unit to some address. Um, there's a woman in her house having troubles breathing and the police is dispatched to that house. Uh, here's the video. 3205, 3205. 3205. Stad en landschap. Daar ligt een mevrouw op de grond, heeft het erg benauwd. So you hear the control room saying, Stad and Landschap beep impen. That's the address of the house while beeping the house number. In all of the Netherlands, there's only one street named Stad and Landschap, and that's in Kr Impen, uh, a place that falls under the supervision of the department releasing the video. So that narrows it down very, fairly quickly. Uh, here you can see one of the officers approaching the house. So the police took the effort of blurring the house number and the number plate of the car. The facade of the house, however, is clearly recognizable, contradicting the prosecutor's requirements. They even left the name of the house clearly visible. And of course, there are many other identifying details like the large flower pot, the architecture, the bending of the road, but not that you would need those, I think. It doesn't take too much effort to determine the exact uh, house number of, um, uh, of this house. We all have Google Street View, Open Street Maps, uh, and some official governmental registration databases at our disposal. For convenience, the police also include some of the shots from the balcony you saw when the fire department is lifting the woman to the ground floor. These shots give you a nice view of the surroundings for further identification, should you need that. And because all of the dispatches of ambulances and fire departments are uh, public with a full address, it's easy to, de to determine the exact date and time of this incident. But even if the police would have blurred the entire facade of the house, much of the interior of the house would still be recognizable for some people, albeit a smaller group. Similarly, for voice. Uh, for true protection of privacy, these the, the voice needs to be uh, deformed, which is difficult if more than one person is speaking at a given moment. So maybe you would simply mute all audio. So if you truly want to anonymize such footage, you would end up with a blank screen. 
Here's an interesting approach of the same problem from the US. In the US, body cam footage and dash cam footage falls under the Freedom of Information Act in many states. And in 2014, the Seattle Police Department received a request to release all dash cam and body cam footage. That's a daunting task with 700,000 hours of dash cam video. Um, with someone working full time, so eight hours a day, five days a week, that would take 330 years of just watching all the video. That excludes the redacting, which would lead to some new definition of job security, I'd say. So the police department, um, they organized a hackathon, and here's the result. So you see a high level of blurring and the removal of all audio. It's enough to see uh, roughly what's going on, but hardly reveals any identifying information. Um, here's another way to do the same, possibly even better, uh, because the color is removed. So it, it allows the police department to release footage fairly uh, quickly and automated, uh, and it allows the general public to search for and identify potentially interesting um, uh, situations. If someone is interested in a particular scene, they can file a request for that scene, and the police then can spend some more time on doing a more sophistica sophisticated form of redaction for that scene only. And here's an, one more issue to consider. It seems easy if you want to outfit your officers with a body cam to just buy a couple of GoPros, make the officers wear them, and give them some guidelines. Of course, there's so much more to do before a GoPro makes you really a pro. Um, having a look at these two clips and guess, so have a look at these two clips and guess what is uh, wrong here, what, what the two clips have in common. Stop it! Move it off set there! Let go! So the lesson here, obviously, if you, wanna, uh, if you want accountability for police violence, make sure the camera is not hiding behind the gun. In each of the videos, the suspect was, was not clearly visible just because the uh, weapon the officer had drawn. And what about the use of footage as evidence in court? One of those other lofty goals. The Canadian police did extensive research about the use of their body cam footage in court. The report was titled considering the evidence, and one of the key findings of that report. Many courtrooms are not equipped to view evidence of body cam, foot body cam footage, and many questions remain unanswered about how courts will handle issues such as managing the volume of footage and the time and cost of viewing and presenting footage as evidence. The report is, by the way, just two years old. So in other words, if you want to have bo body cam footage to be used in court, make sure the court can handle that footage. And of course, the question that remains is, what do you see? So this here is an article of, a, of a last month where the police in the Netherlands, one police department in the Netherlands, exclaims that they now really want to have bad, uh, body, body cams for each and every police officer. The reasoning? In the article, a police officer says, and I quote here, the body cams should provide counterweight to the growing number of um, uh, bystanders capturing an incident on their mobile phone. Because of that, you often miss a part of the context, and the body cam tells you the whole truth. Time for a quiz. Um, uh, the quiz is based on work of uh, law professor Seth Stoughton. I can um, highly recommend um, check out all of his experiments. They're really cool, they're really insightful. He made a couple of videos revealing what uh, body cams show or not. Watch this video taken from a body cam mounted on the chest of an officer. There's no sound, by the way. So, the question is, how threatening was the situation the officer faced? <laughs> to keep it simple, I'll just ask you whether you're on the side of very or somewhat threatening, or little or not threatening at all. So hands up for everyone who thinks uh, this was a very or somewhat threatening for the officer. Uh, a few, like in five, six people, I think. Now, hands up for um, 
those who think it was just a little or not at all threatening for the... Um, ah, that's a lot of... Well, according to the law professor, most people agree that there is a serious, serious threat uh, to the law officer here. Now let's have a look at the same interaction, but from a different angle. <laughs> So that's not exactly a fight, that's some, something of like dancing. Um, because the camera is mounted on the chest, the image goes everywhere as the camera is moving vigorously. And because of that, the image is exaggerating what is going on, and it quickly looks very, very intense. Uh, he calls this deceptive intensity. He also comes to another conclusion. He says that if you tend to trust the police, you are more likely to think that this was threatening. So with this in mind, now, let's watch the first body cam footage again. I can tell you! Okay, get your hands behind you! Stop resisting! Get your hands behind you! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Okay! Stop! Okay! I promise you, they're not dancing, by the way. So here's the other angle. Oh, no worries, there's no sound, by the way. <laughs> So you have to admit, there was a lot of violence here. The situation was threatening, but just not to the police officer, I think. The suspect is clearly peacefully surrendering uh, to the police and still gets beaten. And body cam footage tells you a truth, but it's just one of the truths. Now you have seen this, you should realize that this video tells us a lot more as well. So interestingly, one of the uh, officers deactivates the camera right after the beating, and why is unclear. And when the beating uh, is started, you hear a police officer saying, stop resisting repeatedly. That is done um, right away, and it suggests the repeated uh, thing, it suggests that this is some sort of a standard practice. And the only goal I can imagine, purposely misdirecting the potential bystanders or whoever might review the body cam footage. So this is just to realize uh, what uh, body cam footage is worth if you look at it. So what's next? Um, I think body cams on police officers are inevitable, unfortunately. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we cannot stop that from happening. So, if that's a fact, then let's make the most of it. We should allow the police only to get ahead with policies that are thought through and balanced. In order to get there, we need to make sure we are heard. We need to explain the difficulties surrounding uh, all of the decisions that are to be made when drafting policies. We need to explain our rights, uh, that our rights are trampled if the, pol if the policies are not uh, balanced. And we also need to make sure that no pilot starts as long as it is not also a research project that meets scientific standards. If we don't, we are in 20, year, 20 more years exactly where we are right now. Nowhere. And you know, my worry is that in two years' time, when most of these pilots uh, have been finished, the police will keep on using body cams regardless of the outcomes of those pilots. And therefore, I'd like to do a proposal. Any body cam that is used in a pilot today will be thrown away at the end of the uh, pilot. If the police really thinks there's an added value in the body cams, they can come up with a new proposal which justifies the purchase of new cameras. Such a proposal, of course, is unacceptable if it doesn't come with good policies and doesn't recognize our rights. And, of course, you may consider that as a waste of taxpayers' money, and maybe it is. But I think it's the only way we can, make, we can ensure that there's a public debate about the policies that are applied when the police is using body cams. Without these rules, the pilots will end, the outcome doesn't matter, and the body cams are silently here forever. And one more thing. We need to have the police do exactly what hackers do all the time. Question everything. Thank you.
Thank you, Rayo. Any questions for Rayo Sanger? Please come to the microphones in the front or the back. There must be. Or suggestions, thoughts, anger. Where ideas or policies are also welcome. Yeah, okay. Um, I know the Dutch government has very strict rules about procuring any goods or services. Uh, so also, uh, if the police buys a number of body cams, they should uh, adhere to those procurement rules, which means that there's probably a public publication about uh, buying those uh, cameras and the, um, the conditions uh, under which they will be selected and probably used. Uh, yep. Is it something for, for activists, activists to um, jump in? At the moment, the police starts procuring uh, those kinds of tools and probably other things as well. Yep. Well, that's a good question. Um, and I can tell you, I've already saved you some work because um, I'm since the last one and a half years, I'm almost constantly doing Freedom of Information uh, Act requests to get uh, these, pu these documents public. But unfortunately, uh, that only works if these documents are there. If those documents aren't created or if they are thrown away, then of course there's no record. And um, I can tell you that the police does not keep a record of all the body cams they have uh, uh, procured in the last couple of years. Actually, if you ask them how many cameras you have, they don't know the answer. They are not willing to name a number because they are afraid that whatever number they gave, the give, it's the wrong number. So. Based on my research, I can tell probably Dutch police has at least like in uh, 1,000, 1,500 cameras lying around. Um, half of them are probably in use, the other half is just lying around uh, collecting dust. Um, and I also found another document which suggests that they are not following the rules when buying those cameras. So one of the, um, uh, if the I'm not sure using the right terms here, but if the um, procurement has a certain level of uh, um, uh, money uh, involved, they need to follow specific procedures because it needs to be a European aanbesteding. I don't know what the English term for that is. And um, I have some written document which says that they are exempted from that um, uh, from those rules. So yes, of course, there should be documents um, from buying those cameras but they're not around. So probably if you, um, if you have proof of the police not following their own rules, um, uh, maybe we could uh, write to members of parliament, have them start inquiries, but yeah. it would probably be the best, best way into uh, getting yeah. a hold on this situation. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. There are two comments to this, I think. First of all, or maybe three. So first of all, um, at this time, the Dutch we don't have a government, which makes the parliament also a little bit in a, like in a sort of standby modus operate. Um, yeah, but um, there's, no, yeah. It, 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 there's no pressure for doing things right now. So that's one problem. The other thing is, um, if you found a problem that doesn't guarantee attention in parliament, so um, that's an ongoing struggle with many topics um, I'm working on. Um, so yes, I think that's a good, good suggestion, but it takes some time before we are there. Yeah. The gentleman in the back, please. Um, you had a suggestion for policy to follow, like uh, switch it on if the citizen asks for it. Um, I'm not a citizen, and so I'm not a Dutch citizen, and I think that's okay, as I have less rights here than you as a Dutch citizen, totally okay, but I think in this context, that shouldn't be the citizen who has the right. Uh, if he's not a citizen, he also have, should have the same rights. So maybe you should yeah. use another word in that suggestion. Yeah. yeah, good comment. So that would be like in if a human asks, or maybe not even a human or whatever. Yeah, I get it. Thank you. The gentleman in the front. Um, yeah, I wonder um, if you have any insight from your past research on what the culture of the police, how, how they. Um, what it did with them to be surveilled continuously, because usually it's the other way around, where you know powerful people surveil others, and now they've come into close proximity with this concept yep. of what it's like to be surveilled all yep. the time. Did that change their culture? Did you any feedback on that? Yeah. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I like to work, why I like to research this body cam used by the police, because. Um, like you were saying, it works also the other way around. It's also impacting the privacy of the police officers. And um, 
what you see, I think there are uh, different perspectives to that uh, depending on where you are within your organization. So uh, as I've um, uh, discussed, um, you see that um, in, in some departments there is lots of pushback because people are afraid, police officers are afraid to being surveilled all the time and they don't want to, they don't want it. They're mostly afraid of being, of having the um, recordings used against them. So there's some opposition, but at the same time, um, uh, the higher you are in the organization, I have the feeling that they just want to simply rule out liabilities. So for example, um, one of the things I've seen in those documents is the bring your own device culture. So uh, there are uh, police officers that bought a uh, GoPro themselves and were using it in their day-to-day -day job. <laughs> And of course, uh, there is no facility for, for processing these images at the police station. So I presume those images are being uh, processed at home at the same computer where the 10-year-old kid also um, does play games. So of course, that's something that is un uh, unwanted and um, uh, the staff of police recognizes that problem. So what they are saying is we need body cams officially because then we can e more easily deny the police officers from bringing their own um, uh, cameras. So there, uh, the, the higher you are in the organization, there is less consideration of the um, privacy impact on the police officer, unless there's, le there's legislation, like in you have a um, on the naming serat, I'm not sure, so the workers council, thank you. Um, um, so then they have to think about it, but other than that, uh, no. Next, gentleman in the front, please speak in the into the microphone. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard the news reports about the um, recent drug bust in Baltimore where the police body cam showed the officer yep. planting. Uh, this is so for the people who don't know, uh, the officer basically planted um, some drugs and then 30 seconds later came back into the premises uh, with the body cam active um, and showed him somehow finding this shit which yeah, okay, so uh, this happened because the body cams which were used uh, from what I've read um, have a passive um, recording. And when the officers then uh, actively click, okay, start recording, it uh, recalls the previous 30 seconds. Yeah. So do you think body cams like this would, um, would actually help the situation you were saying about context, or do you think they cause more harm than good? Yeah. Two things about it. First of all, I'm not sure whether the 30 seconds are enough. So I can imagine that in some situations, even those 30 seconds are too short to really understand the context of a situation. That's one thing. And the other thing is that in this particular case, so a police officer didn't realize that the 30 seconds before he was switching it on, uh, that it was also recorded, that's catching only the dumb uh, police officers. Uh, he, he will do that only once, uh, he will make the mistake only once, next time he will take care of those 30 seconds as well. So specifically for that, it doesn't help at all. Gentlemen in the back, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if the information you shared with us today, is there a, a link with the Ministry of Safety and Justice, uh, whereby you, for example, give a presentation in-house to have, you know, the judges that are going to be uh, confronted with evidence from body cams, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are informed about the latest news about this. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, the responsible people within the ministry are fully aware of all the issues surrounding uh, police body cams. Um, there is um, so the involvement of the security and justice. Uh, ministry is uh, mostly, I'd say, because something else. They have a project named Sensing, uh, Sensing and Interception, I think is the full name, and that is mostly about um, uh, having sensors all, our, um, all around us, so whether it's your phone or whether it's an AMPR camera or so a license plate scanner or whether it is um, um, a microphone somewhere or or body cams, for example. Um, so they want to um, get as much of that data, process that, and um, get as close to predictive policing as possible. Um, 
So the ministry is involved in uh, a pilot like, like they are doing right now, but only from that perspective, so only from uh, uh, the information or intelligence perspective. They are not involved, um, so, so maybe if, if politically, politically, like in 2008, which I showed at the beginning, if politically it's interesting to say something about violence against uh, police officers, then they're in, but other than that, not at all. So there's not a direct concern for the ministry concerning the privacy or the protection of rights? Not to my knowledge, no. Now the reason no. why I ask that is because the, 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 the other fellow before this said how, how should we, uh, uh, you know, be, be activists or, you know, help make sure people uh, are aware about these developments. It's, and, and the same thing is that I am wondering is how this knowledge is shared with the ministry yeah. so that they can act upon sure. this and know what they're dealing with. So one more comment on that. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to, um, I don't try to be um, to I, I try to explain to the to the government as well so someone else was just talking about the parliament but at the same time I'm also trying to talk to uh, people from the ministry and explain them the issues surrounding body cam um, body cams by, used by the police and um, I have been talking with people who are responsible for this pilot for example uh, but I'm not sure whether they are listening <laughs> so at least they don't really, they do not really give a sign of listening. They, they say, ah, oh, thank you. And then they go on with whatever they were doing uh, anyways. So, um, yeah, I, I'm trying, but, it, but it's hard. Yep. Okay, microphone on the front, please. Last week on Twitter, there was a suggestion in the United States that as soon as you are approached by uh, an officer, you should call 911. <laughs> well, you can laugh, but they, 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 in the Netherlands, they have uh, in the control room continuous recording of everything that comes in and all the discussions, etc., and maybe also video, because it, it, is, it is locked for supervision of the police people. That was not mentioned anywhere. There, Police people are supervised by, by other police departments or ministerial departments to look if they are doing the job right. And it, it has to be by law recorded and, and sent to a place where it can be kept for a number of years mm. because they want to increase the quality of their work. Yeah? So it is supervised. And you can, if you call them 911, it will automatically locked yeah. yes so but how does that relate to body cams I'm not sure what, what you're suggesting I assume that body cam uh, videos will also be uh, 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 locked and, mm. and placed yeah so it is not the police themselves who, who should be nervous but the research yeah. people have to look at what they're doing. Yeah. Well, as far as body cam video goes, the registration is fairly limited. So um, uh, it depends a bit on the, on the kind of use. Um, uh, uh, you can use body cams to prevent something from happening. You can use body cams to um, have someone else look with you. And you can use it afterwards as evidence. So in the, the second case, where you have someone also looking, it's live streaming, so then it's the control room which can um, look at the images uh, in real time and they can assess the situation and change the tactics if needed. Uh, in that case, the body cam stream is sent to the uh, police station directly. In all other cases, it's, um, uh, it is or is not, <laughs> but it is recorded. Then uh, at the end of the shift of the police officer, it's taken um, from the camera onto a computer where it is supposed to be uh, safely um, stored. That is, of course, a registration. That is, of course, uh, logged. But um, the um, uh, data retention of those body cam streams, I did not talk about it, but it's also an interesting uh, angle. Um, that. Uh, is limited to a couple of weeks, so it, it's not a recording like in for many uh, years. Okay, One small suggestion, please. Uh, maybe maybe we can uh, make a ruling that the control room can turn on the body cam. Yes, that's also an interesting thing. Uh, some of the cases where they have real-time um, uh, streaming, um, 
uh, sometimes they can enable the activate the the recording from the um, from the control room because they um, uh, uh, sometimes the police officer ends up in a fight. The fight is um, uh, very intense, very suddenly, and they doesn't have the time to switch it on. Then the control room can do that. Um, however. One uh, important, uh, one uh, interesting note from one of the documents I um, uh, I got was that they were saying if the control room enables activates the camera from the control room, they need to inform the police officer as quickly as possible because of the chilling effects. The gentleman in the back, please. Yeah, you were saying about the problem with continuous recording. Um, you know, when they're leaving a scene or getting their lunch or whatever, what what happens there? Yeah. Have they has there, there been any trials where they've got the actual officer, they record an entire shift and then say, watch the entire video back and tell us what you think? So, so you're talking about situations where they were... So they just watch their entire shift back? Ah. Um, well... So they they can see for themselves. I'm not sure whether there are any cases, but I, sh uh, I am aware of situations where the, um, uh, where the police um, afterwards look at the footage, mostly to learn from it. And I'm not sure how much of the video then they will see, um, but that's something that is happening. And one of the documents I uh, had made public uh, is that they are saying, we even don't want that because we wa don't want to be confronted with our own behavior. <laughs> The lady in the front, please. Uh, hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I know one of the arguments that is being uh, used in this case is that uh, the people, they use their phones when they interact with the police. Yep. So you would have video documentation from the human being or mm. being perspective. Uh, and so the police needs to have a body cam to, 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 to have the other perspective. What, is, what do you think about that? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Just in a single word? No, really. Um, I would say that the police needs to have the tools to do its work good. And that doesn't, that, uh, the fact that someone else is filming them is a bad, ar is, is a, a horrible, uh, I really don't understand it, is a horrible argument for um, giving cameras to the police as well. Um, that should not be the reason why you give the police the camera. There, there, there are other reasons which are which which are a lot more valid, and maybe there are none. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are, but that that would be the reason why you would give a police officer a camera, not just because the bystander also records. Would you please take that to Parliament as well? Yes, thank thank you. <laughs> sure. Okay, can I have a warm? Sorry, can I ask? Can I can I ask oh, yes, a question? Of course you can. Um, so one of the things I'm really trying hard, but which I'm failing miserably all the time, is getting recorded by a body cam. Every time I see a police officer with a body cam, they are really busy doing some uh, work where they need to uh, need where they where they should not be distracted. Um, but I'm looking for people who are recorded by body cams of the police and which would help me doing a, uh, which want to test how it works with getting access to your own foot, to your the, the footage where you've been recorded yourself. Um, if someone has been recorded by a police body cam, please get in touch with me and um, we have a nice project going on. Okay, thank you. Good idea. Uh, can I have applause for Reo Sanger, please?